Mary and Peter this year? <laughs> I'm still Dan and I worked with Mary and Peter <laughs> this year with Emma Cosm to assist in the technical parts of this year's Chip Hack. Uh, Chip Hack is a three day beginners course on FPGAs and it was held here in Hebden Bridge as part of the Weathering Bites Festival. Uh, and to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the BCS, it was held with an EDSAC theme as the BCS founder president, Professor Sir Morris Wilkes, was the chief architect of the original EDSAC project. Uh, throughout the event, we had several talks on the history of computing relating to EDSAC. Professor Martin, Ka Professor Martin Campbell Kelly discussing the historical significance of EDSAC and Kevin Murrell and Bill Purvis talking about the EDSAC replica pro project at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley. Uh, this year, instead of using the D0 Nano and Quartus, uh, as we have at previous chip hacks, we used the new open source tools and new open source boards from Al Wood and Ken Boak. And this was a lot easier than using the other tools, a lot less painless. It only took the, to the start of the first day compared to the whole of the day to get the tools running. Uh, and then with the rest of the day, we introduced some basic Verilog, making some LEDs on the MyStorm flash. And then in the afternoon, Philip introduced how to program a UART transmitter and then the corresponding receiver. And then on the second day, we started implementing the UART for, uh, the EDSAC peripherals, and Peter will talk to you about this. Um, oh, Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I'm Peter. Hello. I've worked with them because of the project. My work has basically been building the peripherals that were a reimagining of the original peripherals that EDSAC would have had. They're not faithful as they would have looked on the original EDSAC, but they're designed to give an idea of how things worked with the original EDSAC. Um, can we scroll my notes? I shouldn't have written so much. Um, we designed all these peripherals um, so that they could be made by sort of the average home tinkerer or a school. So they're all they're all using relatively low cost materials. The physical parts, uh, most of them are three D printed because a lot of schools now have access to that, and a lot of people in the open source community either have their own 3D printer or know of a maker space where they can use one. Um, they're all available freely through our GitHub. Uh, I'll show you a link to that at the end. So you can go home, you can make them uh, yourself if you want to. Uh, the first peripheral we had was this thing here, which is a printer. It's not very easy to see on the projector, but it's, a, it's a li essentially a little thermal printer like you'd find in a till to print your receipts when you buy something for lunch. Um, but for us, we're using it not to print receipts. Um, we're not really selling things with an ad sack. Um, it would probably be a bit pointless to use that as your till. Um, what we used it for was either to print output from your program so that you could have sort of like a physical output as would have been on the teleprinter on the original ad sack, or we also used it to print uh, paper tape uh, like would be fed into a tape reader to um, use for orders for the original EDSAC. Uh, this is our tape reader. As you can see, the tape we've printed, it's got dots printed on it uh, rather than having holes punched in it. The reason for this is that holes printed on it are a lot easier to produce than either creating something which can automatically punch holes, which is quite complicated, or printing them and then punching them, which would take a lot of time to do manually. Um, we've got five dots wide, plus the line down the middle with the smaller dots is a clock line, so that we can tell which line we're on. Um, the original EDSAC used five dots wide paper tape, which is why we've used five dots wide. Uh, this paper tape reader was probably the hardest bit of making these peripherals, on the basis that looking at things is generally quite hard to do. Um, how we did this was we've got six LEDs uh, up here which shine onto the paper. Uh, they're green LEDs because that's the highest sensitivity of the LDRs we could get. 
and thus, so we reflect the green light off the paper and then look at it with the LDRs to see if we can detect where we're seeing a dot. Um, there's the inside, as you can see with the top off, you can see we've got a row of LEDs and then a row of holes with LDRs in them, which then feed into the Arduino clone at the back here, uh, which we can then read it and then sort of feed it to the things we were using at chip hack. Um, it's got wire holes for wires down the side so they don't get in the way of the paper. Uh, that was quite fun designing the 3D printed parts for. Um, we, while we were testing this, we hooked it up to an oscilloscope, and this is quite a nice picture because, as you can see, these are just right reading straight off the LDRs. This isn't done through our Arduino. Uh, but the, each dip on the line is a dot, and we're re reading in this diagram two different lines of dots, and as you can see, they're different. For example, this one has four quite well-spaced dots and then a row of a load of them in a row. This has two, then a row, then one more, then another row. Um, so we could see quite easily from our oscilloscope that we could read it. Um, the wave's actually pretty smooth. That's because LDRs don't react instantly. Um, and we went for fairly cheap ones because we want to keep the costs down so we weren't getting anything really snappy. Um, that did give us some problems. So we have a motor in here which is attached to a wheel to drive the paper through. It's the second slowest motor we could get, um, so it drives through at about eight instructions a second. So that's slow enough that we can get a fairly good idea of what we're reading. Uh, we have code to read it. Um, it's not reading perfectly. It's got a little bit of errors in there, but um, it's a start. Um, the code's all open source. If you want to have a go yourself and see if you can get perfectly accurate reading, please feel free to do so. Um, the last peripheral we made was a front panel which was designed to load in initial orders. Um, originally on the EDSAC, they had large uni selectors which sort of ran around making la loud ticking noises and then sort of those sent the initial orders into the computer. Uni selectors are very complicated, they're hard to make and if you want to buy them they're quite expensive. So what we've done is we've got two rows of pins, 17 long, because that's how long the initial orders were, and the bottom row is positively charged, and then all the top row goes to input pins on our Arduino behind. Uh, I don't know if I've got a bit better picture of that. No, I haven't. Um, but that means we could connect jumpers along that line so we could set up an, an order in binary, and then we've got three buttons and three LEDs. It's quite hard to see because they're dark blue. Um, but that would help you load them in. And we haven't actually got full code for that at the moment, unfortunately. We didn't get that ready in time. But we have got all the physical parts there. So you can make your own and have a go yourself. Also, this hole here is for seven segment displays, which are run from this board here. In this picture, it isn't fully constructed, uh, but it is now. Um, and that will, that's just there, so you've got an order of how many of the orders you've managed to load in. Um, once you've got an idea of how many of the orders you've loaded in, you know which the next one is you need to do, so you don't get lost halfway through. There's 40 of them. It's quite a lot of work loading them all in, and you wouldn't want to get to number 37 and lose where you'd got to. Uh, that would be very annoying. Um, we did also, instead of doing jumpers, we also made up larger headers with binary numbers on them, so you didn't have to load individual headers, you could load them in blocks, uh, which made them a little less time consuming. Uh, the fourth thing we made, uh, which wouldn't really be called a peripheral, but it's, it's part of the EDSAC, it was physical, uh, was an air delay line, uh, but I wasn't making that, Mary was, so I'm now going to hand over to Mary, who will tell you all about that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mary, I work on the uh, delay lines. I in the original EDSAC, they were used in the logic, and there were lots of different types of tubes. Each one had a different amount of words it could hold. The one I went for was the short tank. It could only hold up to 35 bits in it, and the way that the tubes could hold all this information was by sending sound pulses down through the mercury and uh, 
sensing them and then converting them back to digital input at the other end of the tube and then sending it all around again. I did something quite similar, but instead of using mercury, I used air, which is a lot cheaper and easier to find, and came already packaged with the tube. At one end of my tube was an active buzzer, which could buzz at 14 kilo 4 kilohertz when it was powered. The other end was a microphone, which could digitize the signal that it was seeing. Due to sampling errors with the Arduino, I had to smooth out the microphone input into the Arduino so that it could, uh, with a simple circuit using a diode and a capacitor. This had to be taken into the delay time uh, so that the rise and fall times on the circuit didn't interrupt and cause even more of an error than there was originally. The main idea behind this delay line was that it was simple for anyone to make and so that at the chip hack people could easily interface it with the FPGA because I know a lot of people were beginners and ending up with a delay line would be quite an inspiring e exercise to do. But then it also allowed people who could do Verilog quite well and could do C quite well and had a bit of hardware experience to build upon what I have done and so could go away as a further exercise and s come back later and say, hey, you know what? I managed to make your delay line a whole lot better. And that was quite nice. So in the end of chip hack, almost everyone learned something new, which was what we were aiming for. And Almost everyone also was inspired to go away and learn more Verilog and learn more about the EDSAC and perhaps build their own per peripherals. So the links on the screen are our GitHub pages. If you want to do a chip hack yourself at your local makerspace, there will be my storm boards available. We also have the tutorials that we used. Thanks for listening. So, uh, how many peripherals were there on the original EDSAC? Was it uh, um, those the ones you listed, or were there even more? There were even more. There were, as Hattin mentioned, there were the CRTs, which displayed what was in memory. Um, but EDSAC was over a long period of time, so to start off with, I think there was just loading initial orders, um, tape reader, and the teleprinter. And I think it then gained stuff like... Um, uh, telephone what dial to load numbers in so you could have an input. Um, and I think there were probably a couple of other things by the time it finished, but we were aiming for sort of like trying to replicate an early EDSAC, uh, which made things simpler for us because it was less to make. Um, but yeah, um, so that I think there was a lot more um, which we haven't done. But yeah, if you want to make your own, feel free to. Yeah, um, that's not really a question, it's more a, a statement. I've checked out your peripherals GitHub repository and I've seen you've used OpenSCART to model those things. And I don't know if you know that, but I wrote OpenSCART. That was my project before I made yours. So I'm very satisfied to see my two biggest open source projects so far used in this project combined. Thank you. It's, it's very useful and I find it very easy to use. <laughs> Um, fantastic. Uh, I think it's a case of you have, have now discovered the fact that real software engineers use oscilloscopes. <laughs> yeah, great work, guys. Um, the hours that you put into creating the peripherals, um, many thanks. And 
just to emphasize that chip hack is a totally open source and free to use um, learning resource um, and uh, like they say if you want to uh, dip into it and and adapt it and use it for your know, for your own purposes um, that's part of the uh, the purpose uh, of it um, I found myself in early August in Greece um, and it was too hot outside to do anything so I thought I'd write an, an EDSAC simulator uh, but the only machine I had available was a uh, an MSP430 launchpad board. So I had bits of EDSAC running on an MSP430, and I spent two days writing a program to add two numbers together and display it as a decimal number. And uh, all I can say is, compared to the languages that we have now, if you've got to go back to EDSAC machine language and hand assemble every opcode, it's tough and it, it ties your brain in knots um, and uh, it was good fun and it was a challenge um, but um, uh, yeah we can we can learn a lot from exploring these early machines and and I know you three and her team have had a great summer putting this together and uh, 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 in the autumn the reproduction of EDSAC uh, will be on public display down at the National Museum of Computing, which is uh, down at Bletchley Park. Um, and uh, it's a faithful reproduction of the original 1949. It's open to the public, and you can go and see this vintage computer that really started the modern information age. So uh, thanks again.